Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back. I hope it's welcome back to another rollicking, frolicking episode of Mondays with Mundy. And that's me, Jim Mundy, the historian for the Union League Legacy Foundation. So uh, we're going to go into the Deep South in today's story. And you may wonder why, given that we were a, a civil war institution. But uh, it's, a, it's a really fun story. And especially that this broadcast is being shown for the first time on November the 30th, just a few days after Thanksgiving. Uh, and that's the holiday when most, a lot of other people in this country, go south for a family holiday. And where do they go in Florida? Disneyland. So, seems odd, doesn't it? But we'll get there. We follow the story. And I'm going to share my screen now to bring the PowerPoint up. And hopefully this will make a lot of sense. At least <laughs> some sense. We'll see what happens. But I think it's a fun story. All right. We do slideshow. We do from the beginning. Okay. I see the slides, but I assume that you can all see the same thing I can. So let's see what happens, all right? Okay, so this episode is subtitled, I Wonder If Walt Knew. What did he know or what didn't he? Let's find out. Okay, you all recognize this, right? That's Disney World, the one and only. Uh, that In that 52 million people on average a year visit Disney World, I'm assuming that almost everybody watching this video has been there at one point in time, and I must guiltfully admit that myself. Uh, back in 1980, even before Epcot was open. So it's been a long time. Uh, so how does this story connect to Disney World? Um, we're going to find out. And by the way, uh, since this story concerns geography and land in Florida, I wanted to show you where Disney World is located relative to Florida and the rest of Florida itself, especially North Florida or Central Florida. As you can see, just to the east, uh, we have Kissimmee. And then you have the Orlando Airport further east, and then further north we have Orlando itself. And out of the picture in the upper hand in the corner would be Sanford, Florida. All right. So let's keep those three things in mind. So we've got Walt Disney World to the west of Kissimmee. All right. And Orlando to the northeast. So and I apologize for the breezy Oaks Villas, but it's the only map I could find that shows Orlando <laughs> so, and uh, Walt Disney World. So just bear with me. So all right. So. Our story begins, actually, well, it, it involves, it's all about this guy here, Hamilton Wisting. Uh, we can see his date, 1844-1896. And he was the oldest of four sons of Henry Diston. And Henry Diston uh, was born in Tewksbury, England in 1819. He immigrated at the age of 13 with his father and his older sister uh, to Philadelphia. Within a matter of just a few days, Henry Diston's father, Thomas, had died, leaving Henry and his sister orphans. Henry quickly got a job working in a saw manufacturing company in Philadelphia. And in just less than, uh, this is 1833, so in seven years later, in 1840, young Henry Diston forms his own saw company called Keystone Sawworks. And Keystone Sawworks would evolve into Diston Sawworks, and that would become the world's largest manufacturer of saws. Great story. Okay. So Hamilton was the oldest of the four sons. So there was Hamilton, Horace, William, and Jacob. Okay. So let's take a look at distance. So here we are. That's what the saw works looked like uh, at its height of influence and manufacturing capabilities. Uh, the original company in 1840, Keystone, was uh, located in the Frankfurt neighborhood. And then in 1860, 1872, it was moved north into the Tacony neighborhood where, believe it or not, it is still located and operating as Distant Precision Incorporated. So, um, <clears throat> pardon me. Uh, so, uh, so, young Hamilton, the oldest child, oldest son, is going to take over the reins of the company. So, very early, he becomes an apprentice, like all the other employees at the, at the firm, learning all the different assets and aspects of the trade itself. Uh, the American Civil War, 1861, 1865, Hamilton twice tried to join the Army and twice his father brought him back. So Hamilton obviously is a fairly rebunctious and aggressive young guy, um, but wanted to do his bit. And, uh, you know, um, didn't need an education to be a smart man. Uh, so he never got past high school, even that far. Uh, but in 1866, his father, when after Hamilton comes back from the war, uh, he did finally get into the war in some respect. His father would uh, change the name of the company to Henry Diston and Son, singular, right? So Hamilton is now in a position of influence and managerial responsibility within the company itself. 
in since 1972, the family, you know, the company's getting bigger. They moved to Tacony, and now they're becoming one of the the major industries that would create Philadelphia as the workshop of the world, right? The, as the country's most diversified manufacturing-based economy, an economic powerhouse. And Vista's going to be one of the main players in that in this up-and-coming manufacturing world in Philadelphia. So everything's going well. Uh, 1878. Henry Biston dies, and now the firm becomes Henry Biston and Sons. You can see at the very bottom of the screen. So that's that gets it through the Biston Saw Works. And Hamilton Biston is running Biston, the Biston Saw Company at this point in time. Okay. So our story leads us to this gentleman, Henry Sanford, who was born in Connecticut, son of a wealthy manufacturer. Uh, Sanford Henry uh, basically becomes a career diplomat. Uh, beginning in 1847, he goes into the court. Uh, but he was best well known as being the American ambassador to Belgium, 1861 to 1869, uh, nominated by Abraham Lincoln at the beginning of his administration. It's uh, towards the end of his period in Belgium, uh, Henry is investing in orange groves in Florida. Uh, Lincoln's one of Lincoln's two personal secretaries, John Hay, uh, uh, was doing the same thing. He had an orange grove in Florida that he sold to Henry Sanford, and that got Sanford going. That was in 1868. So Sanford begins to become a citrus um, tycoon in Florida. Now, this is Florida, and it's also post-war Florida. Florida was decimated by the war itself. Um, Florida was not in good shape to begin with. It's mostly swampland at this point in time. Uh, the war comes along. Uh, Florida secedes. They're on the losing side of the war. Uh, it was, uh, it's not in good shape. Uh, in the 1850s, the state had created something called the Internal Improvement Fund, which was a means of raising money to induce railroads to invest in Florida, because if railroads come to Florida, that means development comes to Florida, wealthy people come to Florida, tourists come to Florida, and Philadelphia, and Florida now evolves as a much wealthier and healthier economic state than it would have been otherwise. So it's all about development in the 1850s, ruined in the 1860s. By the 1870s, the Internal Improvement Fund is a million dollars in debt. All right, because the railroads didn't come, and if, what few did were simply wiped out by the Civil War. And then, of course, the recession caused by the Great Panic of 1873. So economically, Florida is in trouble, and, and Henry Sanford needs to protect his investment. So how does Hamilton find out? So Henry Sanford apparently got to know Hamilton somehow, and he invites Hamilton to Florida on a fishing trip in 1877. All right. Uh, somehow he learned that Hamilton was a, a nut about sport fishing. And so Sanford's got two fishing expeditions in mind. Uh, Hamilton's going to go sport fishing, and Henry's going fishing for Hamilton's money, okay, because Florida needs the money. All right? He's, they've got to wipe out that million-dollar debt in the IIF. So uh, Hamilton goes to Florida. He obviously sees the potential of investment and development in Florida, goes back to Philadelphia thinks about it, and in 1881, on, in January, he commits to purchase acres of land in Florida, and on June the 14th, he signs a contract to purchase 4 million acres of land in Florida at 25 cents an acre, $1 million. Surprisingly, just the amount of money that is needed to clear the debt from the internal improvements. I wonder how that happened. And if you don't know, call me and I'll, tell, I'll explain it to you. Anyway, so this is what Hamilton bought. All right? So all that, all that area in pink, although that's not the full 4 million acres. Uh, at the time that Hamilton signed that contract on June the 14th, it made him the largest landowner in America. And according to the New York Times, it was probably the largest land purchase in human history up to that point in time. So, all right. Uh, Within six months, Hamilton would sell off two million acres to an English uh, member of Parliament, um, James, oh, I forget his last name, forgive me. He'll come to me in a second, though. Uh, so now, now he's left with two million acres, but still a substantial amount of real estate that he needs to develop to, you know, to get his money back and even make more money. So I'm going to show you this slide, all right, because what Hamilton needs to do is drain central Florida. I mean, it's 15 million acres of swampland in the entire state. He's got 2 million of it, and it's all underwater at some point in time. So you can see your land, though, in the center, right? And then due um, south of that, if you will, so below it, you see Lake Okeechobee. 
and then you go over to the west coast towards Tampa, right? And then you go down the coastline uh, where you see Sarasota and then Big Cypress Hill. That's basically the chunk of land that Hamilton wants to develop, all right? So, and in the center of all of that, where it says Eastern Flatlands, down to Lake Okeechobee, is a blue line that represents uh, the Kissimmee River. So his plan is to drain the Kissimmee swamp land area and begin his development there. And now keep in mind, there's a reason why Florida is swamp at this point, because it was naturally made that way. All right, it's not going to be easy to drain the swamps. The Dutch might have done it uh, <laughs> in Holland, but that's a different situation here in Florida. So, so within, uh, in less than a year, um, Hamilton creates the Distant Land Company, and they hire engineers and contractors, and so they begin draining as much of that area as they can. Uh, keep in mind, though, that Lake Okeechobee, which is going to be the center of all this stuff, uh, is while it's an inland lake, still was almost tidal in that the, the lake levels rose and declined over time. Uh, and then you add the amount of rain that comes through in tropical storms in southern Florida, hurricanes, it makes it tough to drain a lake and then keep it from being refilled. And that would be a constant engineering problem for the distant land company. So let me, so here we go. So there's Lake Okeechobee at the top. The idea was to take and build canals to power, you know, uh, basically you can see on the right-hand side the St. Lucie Canal that used to be the St. Lucie River on the left-hand side. The Calisahatchee River, okay, also would become canals at the same time. And then just up at the north, you can see Lake Kissimmee coming in. So the idea was to drain that area, drain the lake, and then that would create land for development, okay? All right. Now, keep in mind that when you're a real estate developer, you need, you know, you've, you've got to sell your land to somebody. And so at this point, the distant land company is creating sale offices all throughout the United States, all the major countries in Western Europe. And of course, you, you need some good marketing for all this. And so in 1883, somehow distant convinced President Chester Arthur to come to Florida on a fishing expedition. <laughs> so... And, and what, what better marketing can you have than that? So, so, so Distant's really trying hard to make all this work. Unfortunately, you know, they're, they're making some progress, but, you know, but not as much as they were looking for. So to put this all in more modern context in terms of modern geography, in the center, there's Orlando in that pinkish area. You can see Sanford just north of it, right? Because uh, that's the town that was founded by Henry Sanford, and that's where many of his early orange groves were located. And then south of Orlando is Kissimmee. And that is the headquarters of the Distant Land Company, by the way. That's where it was located. And then you go down through Winter Haven, and then there's that big blue Lake Okeechobee, or to the left, Fort Myers, Sarasota, all right? Spring Hill, Tarpon Springs is in there, just north of Tampa, and St. Pete. That was all land that was being developed by Distant. So Distant was selling off chunks of this land to create these cities. So, so Naples, Fort Myers were all land that was owned by Distant at one point in time. All right? Okay. Now, and, and Distant actually lived in Florida for the better part of the year. So you see St. Petersburg on the left-hand side, right, on the, on the Gulf Coast. Uh, he lived in a town that was called, not surprisingly, Distant City, uh, today's modern Gulfport, which would be on that same peninsula, if you will, but just south of St. Petersburg itself. So Distant is going to make this, make this work as best as he can. So what's going to happen, though? Well, and by the way, here we have the Distant Land Company. Right, you can see it's so they're selling, selling shares of stock in it to raise money, right? And this is what a canal would look like because uh, not only you know as they were you know they had to drain all this water, and so this is a canal up near uh, a little town called Saint Cloud, which is near Sanford actually, so it's northeast of of modern day Orlando. Uh, Distant started a 20,000 acre citrus orange grove there. And this is one of the canals that was built to drain the land on which they would build the growth. So you can see that they're they're fighting Mother Nature though. Um, and by the by the late you know by the late 1890s, I'm sorry, late 1880s, they were having some success, but not enough. So things are touch and go, if you will, right? But in the meantime, Distant is heavily in debt to make this whole process work. So Distant would go back and forth between Philadelphia and Florida. So our story is going to end up in Philadelphia. It's going to be April the 30th of 1896. Liston is in Philadelphia, and that night he and his wife went to the opera uh, with the mayor of Philadelphia, Thomas Warwick, and his wife, 
uh, they would arrive home shortly after midnight, and on the morning of May the 1st of 1896, Hamilton went to bed and never woke up. So here is his obituary in the Philadelphia Inquirer from May the 1st of 1896. It's like, holy cow, what happened? Right. Well, uh, it appears that Hamilton had been suffering from typhoid pneumonia that he caught a few months earlier in Florida. Uh, he never really recovered, and he had some other heart issues, apparently. And so basically his heart came out. At least that's what the official coroner's report said. So other people had other ideas, but that's the story we're sticking with at this point in time. So, so here's Hamilton Distant, one of the wealthiest men in Philadelphia, um, really trying to make a go of things in Florida, become the first real mega development. I mean, after William Penn, think about it. William Penn was the first major real estate developer in, in America, all right, when he got his 50... Thousand acres from from King Charles II, and now Hamilton's got two million. He's got to make work. And instead, he died a young man at the age of 51. So, so that was that. Now, uh, this is the Hamilton residence, uh, the distant residence, forgive me, on North Broad Street, just north of Jefferson. So we're, we're talking today's North Philadelphia. Beautiful, um, looks like a brownstone, Second Empire house. Uh, Hamilton. There was a viewing in the house itself, uh, a pure copper coffin, if you can imagine that. Over 5,000 guests viewed Hamilton's distance body between 8 a.m. and 11.30 a.m. in the morning of May the 5th. In the house, they walked in the front door and out the back. Among those 5,000 were 1,000 employees from the distant company itself. And this was a company at that point that was employing close to between six and 8,000 men and women in their, in their factory, so substantial. Uh, after a few, uh, after an, an, a, 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 you can imagine a sermon being delivered by the pastor of uh, Distance Church, uh, Reverend Colquitt, great Reverend Colquitt, uh, the funeral procession proceeded to Laurel Hill Cemetery in what is now the East Falls neighborhood of Philadelphia, where Henry Distant already lay resting in a family mausoleum. And that's what you see here. So the newspaper article on the left is from May the 5th of 1896. And it says, great men at his beer. Actually, his honorary pallbearers included both senators from Pennsylvania, uh, Donald Cameron and uh, Matthew Clay, Republicans, the mayor of Philadelphia, governor of Pennsylvania, Thomas Hastings, uh, John Wanamaker, all the big names in Philadelphia, the, you know, the industrialist P.A.B. Widener, William Elkins, Thomas Dolan. Uh, I mean, they were all there and they were all league members, not surprisingly. So. Well, on the right-hand side, you see the family mausoleum as it looks today, right? So Henry's in there. Actually, there are three generations, at least, of Winston's buried in that mausoleum. So, so this is an interesting story. All right, let's see what we got. And this is what the mausoleum, this is a different image of it, but it uh, it's in a location at Laurel Hill Cemetery known as Millionaire's Row, and for a good reason. I think I see the beginnings of a future program uh, for one of these talks. We'll see what happens. But anyway, so that's the, that's the distant family mausoleum. Uh, Hamilton uh, had three sons, or three children, rather, uh, one of whom was Henry, and that Henry begat a Henry who begat another Henry, and that Henry is still alive, and he was actually a member of the Union League from 1997 to, uh, 1994 to 2007. I retired from Drexel University, and I believe he's on the board of the, West, of the Laurel Hill Cemetery Corporation. So the distant family is still very much present in Philadelphia, and other members of the family have been members throughout the lake's history up until very, very recently. So the distance are a really wonderful Philadelphia family. And here we have basically what's left of distance, of Hamilton distance in Florida. Although there is, there is there are, there are two lake distance, there are distant streets and things like that. Here we have an historical marker at St. Cloud, again, north of Orlando. And this is where Hamilton distance had his 20,000 acre orange plantation. So. So that's our story. So who would have thought that Disney World is on land that was once owned by a Union League member named Hamilton Piston? Fun stuff. I, mean, you, 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 I can't make this stuff up. I wish I could. <laughs> I'm not that creative. So I hope you enjoyed today's episode of Mondays with Monday. Uh, learn something a little new, something more interesting. And uh, the next time you, you think about going to Florida, think about Hamilton Piston and what could and should have been perhaps. So. Good stuff. So, well, everybody, thank you for watching. Once again, let's thank the Legacy Foundation at the Union League uh, for sponsoring this weekly series. It's a lot of fun. I hope you're enjoying it, and we'll do it again next week. So stay well, everybody. Stay healthy and stay safe. Goodbye now.